Hello, everyone. We'll give a couple minutes for people to come in and kind of filter in because it takes a while for people to get in from the queue. Okay, my name is Moira Swanson, and I am an AmeriCorps member with Conservation Nebraska, and today we are here to talk about geothermal technologies with Gary McDanielson, and we're grateful to have him here today to speak on um, about a technology that's really innovative and up and coming. So Gary, if you want to, I will pass things off to you. Thank you, Moira. I appreciate the invitation to talk to everybody tonight, and thanks for having me. Um, I'm going to start sharing my screen here, if I can find it. Okay, can we see that? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Uh, so the topic I'm talking about tonight is getting to know geothermal energy. And there's a, geothermal is a fairly complex, uh, complex area because there's various facets of geothermal. So I'm, I'm going to talk about all of them um, and, and give you a broad, you know, geothermal 101 kind of uh, background. So let's see. Why is my, here we go. Um, so first, let's talk about the problem um, is there's a global thirst for energy. Uh, you know, energy usage just goes up and up and up. And, um, you know, right now, the, the majority of our energy is supplied by fossil fuels. And, and everybody knows that's a problem. It leads to climate change through greenhouse gases and depletion of resources. It's not unlimited. Um, so if we keep burning fossil fuels sooner or later, we're going to run out. Um, so we'll, we'll heat up the planet and run out of fuel. And then we're then we're nowhere. So, so there's a, a real massive shift happening to renewable technologies. Um, and you see it everywhere. Um, new wind farms being built, uh, large solar farms being built. Um, the problem with the wind and solar is that they're variable and intermittent. Um, you know, wind only works when the wind blows and so solar only works when the sun shines. Uh, so they're not baseload power and it causes grid instability. Um, so the way around that to mitigate that, of course, is energy storage. Um, but large scale energy storage technologies really aren't ready for prime time. Um, they're very expensive and uh, not very cost effective. There's lots and lots of work being done on that. And I'm a big solar and wind fan. So fingers crossed, they'll get that fixed. But but for right now, wind and solar causes problems. And, and you saw the problem down in Texas uh, a couple of years ago. Um, the wind turbines froze up and shut the grid down. Um, so, so that's right now, that's part of the solution, but it's not, not the solution. Um, then you have biomass um, and it's great. It's renewable, but it's, it produces greenhouse gases too, because bi biomass are, is carbon based. And so it, it makes CO2 as well. So it's, it's not clean. Um, and then the other ones we have are hydroelectric power and conventional geothermal. Um, hydroelectric is kind of maxed out. There's only so many rivers you can dam. Um, so it's, it's limited. Um, and, and conventional geothermal, which I'll talk to you about a little bit later, it's, it's also geographically limited. Um, it only works in certain parts of the world. So it's not scalable. Um, and, and you've also got the problem of energy equity in, in developing nations. And, you know, as they're putting in power and um, energy solutions, we don't want them putting in fossil fuels and greenhouse gas solutions. So we want cheap, scalable, renewable energy. Um, just to give you an overview, this is the U.S. in, in energy consumption by source. And you can see petroleum at 36, uh, natural gas at 32, uh, coal at 10, 11 percent, uh, nuclear at eight. Uh, they dominate the landscape. Um, you know, wind and solar still only make up, um, you know, about five percent of the energy uh, consumption in the U.S. And geothermal is a paltry 0.2 percent. 
Um, so, you know, there needs to be a, a, a step change, a shift um, in energy. And, you know, I, I'm a firm believer in geothermal energy um, for many, many reasons. One, um, the center of the earth is as hot as the surface of the sun. So if, if you drill down deep enough, you're going to hit a lot of heat and a lot of energy. And so it's it's a huge source of energy and um, and it's completely clean. It makes no greenhouse gas emissions whatsoever. And, and unlike wind and solar, it's baseload power. It's it's hot. The heat beneath our feet is is down there 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So it solves many, many of the problems. And so I, I, I'm a firm believer that geothermal is, is <coughs> excuse me, going to be one of the waves of the future. So geothermal energy can be divided into three categories. Um, you take the heat and use it directly. You just take the heat and 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 uh, use it to heat buildings, heat heat greenhouses, things like that. Um, uh, then you can have geothermal heat pumps um, to replace conventional heat pumps. Uh, they're much more efficient. Or you can actually generate electricity with it. And uh, this graph here shows. Um, you know, the current utilization, uh, it's, it's a British chart, so it uses an S instead of a Z, um, utilization of geothermal energy. Um, and you can see electricity is about 40% of it. Um, space heating and, and heating of buildings is about 43%. And then um, the other 17% is various uses, melting snow, heating swimming pools, fish farming, that kind of thing. Um, but those are the three main uses of geothermal. So let's talk about direct use. Um, you can take low temperature geothermal resources, which range anywhere from 122 degrees to 302 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, to use it directly, you typically want to use water that's close to the surface. Um, and you can use it to warm um, single buildings or even whole districts, a thing called district heating. Um, there's a lot of cities around the country that use district heating and around the world. Um, you can use direct heat for heating swing pools and spas and greenhouses. Um, and it's also can be used in, in cooking and various industrial applications like drying for fruits and vegetables and, and timber. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, direct use is you just take the hot water and, and you, you use the heat to, to heat things. Um, um, and, and it's interesting, the natural geothermal systems where the hot water is close to the surface, they are scattered around the country um, in natural pools and hot springs. And so, um, you know, in those areas where you have hot, hot springs, uh, there's hot water that's available, but it's not everywhere. And so we've got to find if we're going to use uh, direct heat applications, you have to find other sources of hot water. Um, district heating is, is another way that hot water is used, um, and it's used in a lot of cities, you know, St. Louis, New York, San Francisco, uh, those kinds of things, and what they do is they, they pump hot water through pipes into the buildings to heat the buildings, um, and then, you know, through radiator systems and things of that nature, um, and then the, the cooler water is returned back to the heating plant to be reheated again. Um, so, uh, you know, hot water is transmitted 24 hours a day, seven days a week, um, or steam, and it, it's very effective and very cost effective. Um, one of the problems we have today, though, is most of the district heating systems that are out there, at least in the United States, they use natural gas to heat the water. And so even though it's, it's, it's efficient, um, it's still not very green. Um, here, here sort of shows you district heating systems around the country. And, and you see it a lot of airports, colleges, universities, um, downtown areas, as I mentioned, uh, you know, like New York City, um, government buildings, there's a lot of government buildings that use them, um, hospitals. Uh, so district heating is, is fairly widely used and, and that's the good news. So, so as, as we find new sources of hot water besides you, you, heating the water with natural gas, such as geothermal hot water, a lot of the infrastructure is already in place. 
Uh, so that's that's the really good news is is that all, all of these places are already using hot water. So we just need to replace that hot water with hot water from geothermal as opposed to hot water from using natural gas. Um, here's a partial list of district heating systems in Nebraska um, and uh, that have been done over the years. Um, the, the, the problem with that is most of these have been shut down and the only Lincoln and Omaha systems are still operational. Um, but um, they haven't shut down. It doesn't mean they can't be resurrected. Um, here's an example of, of a small system. It's in the College of Southern Idaho. Uh, this little tiny geothermal system, uh, it's a district heating system. It, it heats a half a million square feet on campus. So it doesn't take much of a footprint to be able to heat uh, a lot of space. Uh, so the key is being able to get that hot water, geothermal hot water up to the surface and then run it through the insulated pipes to all of the buildings. Um, here's a few interesting facts on district heating. Um, believe it or not, Russia is the global leader. Uh, they have more than 17,000 district heating systems serving 44 million customers. Um, it's a cold place and they've got to find ways to heat, heat their buildings. Uh, there's also quite a bit in Europe um, uh, that are providing heat to 100 million people across 32 countries. And, and you always hear about Iceland when you talk about geothermal. Um, they're, they're really, really big in geothermal, and they use district heating in 95% of their homes and buildings. So, um, you know, they, they sort of set the example for everybody. Um, and as I mentioned, New York does have the world's biggest uh, district heating systems. It was created in 1882 with um, over 100 miles of pipes running under the streets of Manhattan. Um, but the problem there is most of the hot water comes from burning natural gas. Uh, but it could be converted to geothermal. Uh, the next, next use of geothermal are, are geothermal heat pumps. And, and they work just like a regular heat pump, um, but they're much, much more efficient. Um, and the reason being, when you use your heat pump, you're trying to extract heat out of the outside air or, or cool with the outside air. So when you get, um, um, you know, uh, really, really, really cold temperatures, for example, there's not a whole lot of heat in that outside air. And so your heat pump really has to struggle to keep up. And, and a lot of times electric resistance heaters come in to make up the slack. Um, if you use geothermal, when you go down uh, about 20 feet, the, the ground temperature is a constant 50 to 60 degrees Fahrenheit. So that, that makes a heat pump really, really happy. Um, because when you're trying to cool your building, um, you know, the air conditioning cycle, hey, it's 50, 60 degrees. So you've got a nice source of cold water or, or cold heat exchange fluid uh, to help cool your building. And when it's hot outside, hey, you've got nice 50, 60 degree, uh, uh, you got the 50, 60 degree water to, to cool. And then when it's cold outside, you've got a nice warm 50 to 60 degree to help heat your building. And so, um, these heat pumps use 25 to 50 percent less electricity than conventional um, HVAC system and much, much less pollu pollu uh, pollution at about 44 percent decrease in greenhouse gases. Um, so I, I know many people that have geothermal heat pumps. My neighbor across the street does, and, and his electric bill is, you know, pennies compared to mine. So they really, really are nice. Um, I recommend anybody that's building a new house, uh, put in a geothermal heat pump system and, and put it into your mortgage and spread it out every time. And your, the reduction in your energy bill will more than offset the increase uh, amount of dollars on your monthly mortgage payment. Um, the third way um, to, to use geothermal power is, is um, use that hot water to generate electricity. And um, you know, you, if you get temperatures that are above, say, uh, 120 degrees centigrade, um, which is around, um, you know, three, 285 to 300 degrees Fahrenheit, um, it, you can make electricity out of that hot water. And um, so that, that's, a, that's a real solution for, for generating power as opposed to wind and solar and nuclear and the others. 
So wh where is geothermal electricity today? Um, currently about 16 gigawatts are installed and producing globally, um, 3.8 gigawatts in the United States. So the US is the largest um, producer of geothermal electricity. Um, and, and it's followed by places what you would think of where, where there's volcanic activity around the ring of fire. Um, Indonesia, the Philippines, uh, Turkey, uh, New Zealand, Mexico, uh, Kenya, Italy, place, you know, Iceland is down there, um, Japan. These are all places where there's volcanic activity, which means then that there's hot water, the magma is up close to the surface uh, that, that can heat water that's close to the surface. Um, and they use flash steam plants and binary power plants to take, take advantage of the hot water and uh, produce electricity. And how they do that is say for the flash steam plants, that water's down there um, at, at very hot temperatures. Um, just say it's at 250 degrees or 300 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so they, you pump that water up to the surface, it flashes to steam and that steam then runs turbines um, it, it pushes pushes on turbines, which then um, those turbines run generators to generate power. So the, the same way a natural gas plant would work or a coal plant would work or even a nuclear power plant would work. All of those technologies basically use their, their power, their, their, their oil and gas, their, their nuclear, their coal to generate steam to, to run turbines and generators. And geothermal is no different. You pull up that hot water, flash it to steam, and run turbines and generators. Um, so the power companies like it because it, it generates power the old-fashioned way and in and, and the way that they know how to do it. Um, but, but as I said initially, the problem with conventional geothermal today is it's geographically rare. Um, it's around areas where there's um, volcanic activity and hot water close to the surface. So, so you see the uh, you know, the, the, in the U.S., you have the West Coast. You're out there. California has a place called the Geysers, and you've got the, you know, the uh, the volcan volcanoes out there in Washington and and such, um, and down in Mexico, and then you have all around um, the Pacific Rim, the volcanoes in the Philippines and Indonesia, um, and, and then you, of course, you've got volcanic activity around the Mediterranean. You know, like Mount Vesuvius type stuff. Um, so. And, and Iceland, of course. So, so these are areas where they put in geothermal because uh, the hot water, because of the volcanoes and, and the plate boundaries, the hot water is close to the surface. Um, but the problem with it being geographically rare is um, it's, it's not particularly scalable. Um, so um, it's, it's nice and cheap at six to eight cents a kilowatt hour. Um, but it only represents about 2% of the renewables and only about 0.4% of the U.S. electricity market. Um, so there's a lot of work going on now trying to say, well, how do we, how do we expand upon that? Um, so uh, there's several experimental systems that is being worked on today. Um, the Department of Energy has a project called Forge. Uh, there's Quas Quasi Energy. It's out of MIT. And they're spending lots and lots of money. Um, and the theory being that uh, if you drill down into the hot, dry rock, um, it, it, the rock is really hot. It can be, you know, 350, 400 degrees and, or higher, depending on how deep you drill. Um, and then what you do is you pump, pop, pump water down there. Um, down, you have to drill a couple of wells. One, you drop, pump cold water down. It heats up by the rock and then you pump it out the other well as, as steam to run your turbines and generators. Um, and they're working on that. They've got some issues, some physics constraints, and the other. But um, we're all we're all crossing our fingers and hoping they can make it work. Um, uh, then there's loop technologies. Um, it solves a lot of the problems of the hot, dry rock technologies. Um, and there's several companies, Ever Technologies and Sage Geosystems, that are working on that. Um, uh, they also have a physics constraint on conductive heat. And so right now they have to drill lots and lots of these underground loops, um, which then makes it very expensive. So the economics of the loop technology is not very good right now, um, but they're working on it. So uh, there is hope. Um, then my company, um, Geothermal Technologies, we have a technology called Genesis, 
which was developed at Johns Hopkins University initially, and, and then we've been working on it for the last five, five six years now. And, and we, do, we do something very similar to the first generation, uh, the, the conventional geothermal, which is harvesting the hot water around volcanoes. Um, and we, we basically said, well, where else is there hot water? And, and there's hot water in, in sedimentary aquifers. And these are globally abundant. They're all over the world. So if we can tap into these hot sedimentary aquifers, um, then we begin we become scalable. We don't have to be where there's volcanoes. We just have to be where there's aquifers. Um, and so um, we, we've been reducing the cost and risk by reusing oil and gas technologies and data. And um, um, we, we believe our technology is going to dramatically reduce the cost of heat and power. And um, and, and extend system longevity because um, uh, you know we won't have that physics constraint of cooling cooling off the rock. So this is kind of what it would look like. Uh, there's two 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 uh, wells that are drilled, uh, represented by those black lines. Um, there's one here and one here. If you can see my mouse. Um, and what happens is one is a, a production well. So, so we drill down into these hot aquifers. Um, think of them as an underground lake um, or a bathtub full of sand and water. Um, and what we do is we'll pump the water out of this underground lake or aquifer through one of these uh, wells. And then we extract the heat from it through a heat exchanger. And then we pump the cooled water back down the other well. So essentially we're circulating water through the system. And um, th this is the way, uh, if you see the little arrows, um, that, that's the uh, underground heat flow in the aquifer and water flow in the aquifer before we start up our system. And then once we start up our system, um, we, we, we start pumping the water. There's um, pumping going on. Uh, there's temperature changes uh, from hot water and cool water, di temperature differentials that cause the water in the aquifer to start to flow. And we actually can harvest water, um, you know, several miles from where our well pair is uh, by getting the water flowing throughout the aquifer and flowing to our system. So that um, convective recharge helps drive longevity. And, and we believe that um, a, a single well pair can last about 80 years. Um, we haven't done it yet because we haven't been running these systems 80 years. It's a new technology, but um, all of our modeling shows that these will last for a long, long time. So what is a, a hot sedimentary basin or aquifer? <clears throat> it's areas where um, uh, sand has accumulated and limestone has accumulated um, between hills and, 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 and hard basement rock. And, and then with rain and other things, it, it, it starts to fill in with water around all the sandstone. And that, that water gets heated up by the earth. Uh, you can see in the top drawing a heat source. Well, that's the heat coming up from the center of the earth and heating in the water. So you've got these underground lakes underneath of all this limestone um, that we then drill down into and tap into that water. And what's neat about it is, is these things are globally prolific. Um, so anything in here that's, that's green or blue or light green um, is where these sedimentary aquifers exist. So you can see they're all over the world um, and not just around the ring of fire. So where the, the first generation of conventional geothermal only works in places like the Pacific coast, um, you know, this can work in Illinois and, and Nebraska and Colorado and New York and Ohio and Chicago. So um, it makes this, this technology scalable. Um, uh, where, where you, and, and as another thought we have is wherever there's organic rich shale formations where, where they're currently looking for oil and gas, um, uh, there's also beneath all these oil and gas basins, there's almost always a hot sedimentary aquifer. So uh, you can see here the basins that are around uh, and you can see you know, that there are some basins in various parts of Nebraska as well. So they're, they're prime spots 
Um, and a lot of times these aquifers extend beyond the sedimentary basins um, for um, the shale formations. Um, but you can see you've got uh, up and down the East Coast through the Appalachian Basin, you've got the Utica Shale and Marcellus. So you've got, you know, uh, all of the cities of, um, you know, P Pittsburgh, Cleveland, Columbus, um, Baltimore, um, all of those cities. And you've got the cities of Detroit and Chicago through the Antrim and New Albany, uh, basically part of the Illinois Basin. Um, so so this, this technology is scalable. And um, because these systems will last for 60, 80 years, you can depreciate the cost of all the capital. Uh, building, building a five megawatt geothermal power plant costs about $50 million. So it's very expensive. But if you can spread that $50 million over uh, 20 years, uh, the cost of the power goes way, way down. And um, so you can see here that the, the Genesis technology is anywhere from two and a half cents a kilowatt hour to five cents a kilowatt hour. Um, so uh, it's very competitive with all of the other technologies, um, you know, including solar and wind. Um, so, so we're hoping that our, our technology with using hot sedimentary aquifers is going to revolutionize how we harness renewable energy. We can take make electricity out of it. And then the hot water that's left, we can send off to district heating systems and run, run them to greenhouses and um, uh, you know, uh, fish farms and everything else. So um, we're very optimistic about uh, the technology. So I, is this the time we ask for questions? If you're ready, yeah. Um, if you guys want to go ahead and use the Q&A feature down on the bottom of your screens, you can ask Gary some questions if you have any. Um, before that, I am going to launch a poll. So if anybody has any questions, feel free to ask Gary. And then in the meantime, take this quick poll. It takes about 30 seconds, not even. There's only four questions on there. This is how we maintain funding for our events. So it's really important that you guys take this survey. How did you get started with geothermal technologies? Um, very interesting. Um, I'm a, a like a serial uh, entrepreneur. Um, I've done, but prior to geothermal technologies, I've done six companies um, and start them up and grow them to 30 to 50 million in sales and then sell them off to a strategic buyer. And uh, I've done businesses in solar energy um, and fuel cells, uh, clean air technologies for like catalytic converters for cars. Um, I did industrial water purification for uh, cleaning up industrial wastewater and drinking water purification. Um, so I've always been, my, my whole career has always been around clean air, clean water, clean energy. And um, uh, so I had just um, sold uh, my last company, which was doing um, hydrogen uh, and um, hydrogen for fuel cells and that kind of thing, and was looking for another company to, to run. And I found this technology at Johns Hopkins and said, this is really, really interesting. Uh, so I took a license from Johns Hopkins for the technology and then raised some seed funding to get the company started. And uh, five years later, here we are, we're um, you know, building our uh, geothermal, our first geothermal power plant outside of Denver, Colorado right now. That's so cool. So another one is residential geothermal heating a viable option for heating in areas like Nebraska that get extremely cold in the winter? Would it need to be supplemented by other heat sources? Um, yeah, it's very viable as a matter of fact, um, because it's colder, um, you know, extracting the heat from the ground um, <clears throat> really makes your heat pump work very efficiently. Um, <clears throat> so I, I would believe that, uh, uh, you could save a lot more money in Nebraska than you could someplace where it's warmer. Um, so I think I think that it would be very good. Um, you know, most most heating systems 
do do put in a backup heat source like uh, resistance heating, but but in a, a geothermal system in some place like Nebraska, probably would never use it. It would just be there like as emergency heat. You're welcome, Jessica. And then what is your educational background? What would you recommend a young for young folks who want to enter the clean energy workforce? Um, that's a good question. I mean, there's lots of different opportunities, right? Um, uh, you know, there, there's opportunities to operate geothermal power plants or construction to build these things. So there's lots of construction jobs for uh, people that have you know, electricians and plumbers and, and um, you know, people working on the drilling rigs, uh, that kind of thing. Um, then there's, there's um, jobs for professionals for like geologists, uh, geophysicists, um, hydrologists. I'm, I'm a chemical engineer, so I'm an engineer. Um, we, we do heat exchanging and things like that to take the hot water and, and produce power. Um, so uh, the, the, any kind of an engineering degree would be great. Any kind of a science degree, uh, you know, our geologists get down there and study the rocks and the porosity and permeability of the rocks to make sure that it's, you know, the, the right, uh, right uh, properties so that the water will flow properly. Um, but but there's, there's jobs, you know, anywhere from, um, you know, skilled labor to, to you know, uh, uh, you know, operate operator and operator jobs and maintenance jobs, um, and certainly uh, accounting and um, HR as well, because these are big operations and have a lot of people. So you can work in the office in accounting. And um, so I think, you know, choose a career that uh, interests you, and there's probably a job in the geothermal industry. And then Peggy said, great program. Gary obviously knows what he's talking about. I've heard good things about geothermal energy. Thank you. Thank you. And then another question. My backup heat source has never run in Lincoln since my system was installed in 20 or er, in 2009, even during the polar vortex in February, 2021. So the backup heat system didn't work. Um, I don't know if that was a geothermal problem. Oh, she's saying it was not needed. It was not needed. Yeah, yeah, uh, exactly. So I think a geothermal plant probably would not need the backup power. They're they're just there just in case. They, you know, so your house doesn't freeze and your water pipes don't freeze. But a, a, a geothermal system is very efficient and very reliable. Um, I think my neighbor's had his now for 10 years and hasn't had any problems with it. And then just a reminder to everyone to take the poll really quick. We have most of you responding. We're waiting for about five more people to respond though. And like I said before, this is how we maintain funding for events like this so we can keep these free. If you have any more questions, feel free to use the Q&A or the chat. Um, Carrie said, how does UNL use district energy? Um, I'm, I'm not familiar with them specifically, but typically colleges um, use the hot water uh, to heat the buildings um, and a lot of government installations do the same thing. So, um, you know, the old fashioned way with, with radiators and uh, they, they run the hot water through pipes and then, you know, run, run the air across the hot water in the pipes. So it's kind of a little mini heat exchanger, um, almost like the radiator on your car, right? Um, You've got the, the radiator takes all the hot water from the engine and then you run air across it from the outside to cool the water. Um, and it's the same kind of thing. Um, they bring up the hot water and then run, run air across it to heat the air, which then goes into the buildings. So to heat the buildings. 
And then to answer more specifically for UNL, how they use district energy, I'm not sure if it is district energy or not, but I know that they use wastewater to heat and cool the building at the Nebraska Innovation Campus. But I'm not sure if that's technically district energy or not. I'm yeah, not it, it probably would be considered district energy. Um, okay. That's what I thought. Yeah, there's many sources of the heat, right? Like I say, a lot of people use natural gas to heat the water to make district energy systems. And we would prefer that they, they drill and bring up hot water from geothermal because then you don't have to burn any gases to make the hot water. Are there concerns with rupture or breaking in the underground lines, especially in locations with seismic activity? typical of locations with increased geothermal heat slash activity? Um, yes and no. Um, they, for, uh, that's yet to be seen. Um, typical of the geothermal plants that are in, in the seismic areas, they just drill vertical pipes right down into the hot water and pump it up. And they're, they're you know, 10, 12 inches in diameter. So, and and, um, and they're cased with steel or, or some metal, metallurgy so they don't corrode um so they're just basically vertical pipes um so you know if they rupture um you know it's still a hole right so if the pipe breaks a little bit the water still still can flow um it just might leak out of the pipe a little bit um but but th some of these later technologies now are looking to go not only vertical but now drill um, drill laterals that go horizontal from there so they go down and make make a right turn and, and drill long laterals that can go out a mile or two miles. And, and they're doing that so they can increase the amount of water that they can access. And, and that's relatively new. There's companies like Fervo Energy that's work, working on that right now out in California um, in places like the geysers and the Salton Sea and where there is seismic activity. And so they're just starting to do that in the last year or two. So it remains to be seen if if that's going to cause them problems with their underground underground lines because they're going to be running out a mile or two. Um, so stay tuned, I guess. That's a good question, though. I, I think the answer is we don't know yet. Okay, looks like we're have gonna, gonna have everyone that's going to respond to the poll responding. So I'm gonna end it now. Thank you all for responding to the poll. I really appreciate that. Yeah, follow on to that last question is where we're gonna do it in hot sedimentary aquifers. Um, you know, there is not seismic activity. And so, um, you know, hopefully our, our horizontal pipes won't, won't have any rupturing problems. That looks like all the questions that we have. Thank you so much, Gary, for taking the time out of your day and everyone else for being here. I really appreciate everyone coming together and taking the time out of their day and being here so we can learn a little bit today. It's my pleasure and go, go geothermal. <laughs> Thank you, Gary. Very informative, someone says. Yeah, I see that. I'm reading the chat as well. Oh, okay. So thank you, Carrie, for listening in. Okay, well, we will see you guys next time. Um, yeah, Mara, keep me po posted. I'd be interested in sitting in some of these myself. I will. Okay. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.